Sue Jatha, welcome <laughs> to this restorative justice life. Who are you? Oh my goodness. Thank you for having me. Um, who am I? I am a Buddhist practitioner. Um, yeah. Who are you? I am an amma, a mother, uh, and a sister, and a daughter, and a wife, and a partner, and a, yeah, I'm a family member. Who are you? I am a restorative justice practitioner. Who are you? I am a peacemaker. Who are you? I am a lover of everyone and everything. <laughs> who are you? I'm someone who loves to feed people healthy food and healthy ideas. And finally, for now, who are you? I'm a humble student. <clears throat> for those of you watching us on YouTube, you can see... <laughs> the warmth, love, the energy radiating off the screen. And if you're just listening, hopefully you're picking that up. Um, this conversation <laughs> has been a very, very long time coming. Um, mm. By the way that you got on the call, um, confirmed something for me. We've met a handful of times at uh, restorative justice conferences. And like, I don't expect you to remember me and oh our interactions, but every time, <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, and I'm going to share like one of those um, incidents a, a little bit later, but every oh, time <laughs> I've been in your presence, it's been um, a wonderful feeling. And, you know, I need, it's important for me that uh, folks are given their flowers while they're alive and present mm. and able to receive them. And um, I am so deeply excited to, to have you here on the podcast. Um, you know, no shade to any of the other guests, but like when I first started this <laughs> 120 episodes ago, like like getting Sujata on here oh. was, you know, maybe top of the list. Shout out to Shell Graves, shout out to Tashmika, shout out to mm. um, a bunch of different folks who have um, put put me on to your work. Oh. Um, and it's really good to be here. Um, so I'm just gonna let you receive that. Oh my gosh, you can tell from my face those are watching. I'm like, oh, she's really uncomfortable because she doesn't do this part well. So, oh, okay. I will so, with that it. being said, yes, receive it. You don't even have to say anything, just receive it to the extent that you want to answer the question, though. How are you, um, mm. today? Well, I'm humbled, um, and uh, it's wonderful for the next generation of people lifting up this work um, to remind me that it's had impact, right? Like, and, you know, I was looking at your face thinking, I kind of feel like I recognize that guy from somewhere other than your podcast, right? But so that we've met um, <clears throat> is wonderful. And um, yeah, I think today I am, it, uh, the sun is coming out. Uh, I live in the Bay Area. It's um it is, uh, I feel like at this is moment in time, it feels like, I know that the world is really, really hard right now in so many ways for so many folks. Um, and I feel like the sun is starting to come out in some ways, not just because we're pre pretending that the pandemic is over um, and everybody's sort of going about their business, but at some deeper level, I feel truly optimistic at this moment, uh, despite all, um, how do we do on cursing on this podcast? Are we trying to keep it clean here? Say whatever the fuck you want. <laughs> okay, great. I would say despite the fuckery um, that is flowing in all the different directions, I am feeling optimistic these days. So yeah. Where's that coming from? Um. <clears throat> I spend a lot of time with Tibetan Buddhist teachers and uh, with indigenous folks who have long view. And so, you know, I've heard a lot of times from a lot of people, even at some of the worst and darkest moments, like you don't know how the story ends. Like, and stories don't actually ever end. It just keeps transforming, transforming. So just, just hold tight. Like, you know, just keep applying good efforts. And um, that, that is, that is in the, that's going into the pot, you know, it's going into the, into the process. And so uh, I've been getting that message a lot from a lot of teachers lately. And so that is, um, it is infecting me in all kinds of good ways with uh, optimism and positivity. So that's how I'm feeling today. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> for a lot of folks, um, restorative justice is this thing that we have focused on the criminal legal system and alternatives to punishment. That has definitely been a part of the work that you have done. We all know uh, 
hopefully if you're listening to this podcast that this work is so much more than that right it's this sort of justice life this way of being which mm. you've articulated in in the communities that you're a part of right um the words restorative justice weren't necessarily your way into being this way mm. so in your own words mm -hmm. how did this journey start for you well thank you for asking that yeah and i um Although I had had a friend who was saying the words restorative justice to me for years, they didn't, the words didn't originally resonate with me and I didn't actually uh, follow her wise, um, <clears throat> her wise suggestion that I, I take a look at this stuff. Um, and instead my, my coming to uh, this way of life, this way of being, uh, it was, it's a personal journey. I, I myself, um, and, and just advising folks who are watching this to take good care of yourselves because my personal journey involves uh, sexual and, and domestic violence. Um, and so I was trying to find my way to my own healing um, in that way that young people do, which is to think that if I solve the problems all out there and I make sure that nobody else lives through what I lived through, that somehow that that's going to make it that my trauma got healed. And while surely um, – the collectivity of the healing journey is an incredibly important part of it. Um, you know, all of my attention was pretty much turned outwards. I was doing like the requisite amount of therapy uh, to hold it together. Um, but it wasn't really healing me at the deepest level for the child sexual abuse that I endured as a child and uh, the multiple sexual assaults and one rape that I'd experienced at that point. And so, um, and just growing up in a house in which we felt fear. Um, and so I, um, Ended up, I was working in, um, I was trying to work at that time. I was living in Mumbai in, in India with my then partner. Um, and uh, he was doing this wonderful work trying to um, help folks who had been trafficked from Nepal, young young children who had been trafficked into sexual slavery. Um, and he, um, I had a breakdown. I couldn't help him. I could not help with this project. And I ended up going traveling by myself and ended up in Dharamshala, which is where the Tibetan uh, community in exile was living at the time. The Tibetan government in exile um, was there, is there. And I, um, through this unbelievably bizarre course of events, <laughs> wonderful course of events, uh, got to have an hour alone with the Dalai Lama uh, when I was 24 years old. And um, he really encouraged me in my work and also just really encouraged me to uh, put my own healing at the center of the work. Um, and it was through that journey. He had no interest in converting me to anything. If anything, he felt pretty strongly that, you know, everybody has their path and they should, you know, ideally stick to your own, your own cultural roots. If it's, if it's home for me, you know, the Buddha Dharma actually started in Nepal. The Buddha was born in Nepal and, um, you know, flourished in India and, uh, the Indian traditions of, Buddhism were actually lost to India, but kept alive by the Tibetan Buddhists, the very practices actually that were influenced by some of the people who, you know, are involved in sort of my family's Hindu lineages. Um, and I had wanted to leave Hinduism. I had left Hinduism because of my um, really um, unsettled feelings around caste. And mm -hmm. so uh, I knew that I was looking for, I'm a very spiritual person, religious person was looking for a path and through meeting his holiness and his holiness actively encouraging me to consider um, upending oppression, particularly the kinds of oppression that I myself had experienced and to shamelessly name my own place in that work. Uh, basically he encouraged me to be a public survivor and, uh, and, and that really started, started that journey. Um, Shortly thereafter, I started law school. I realized that the binary ways of thinking about the law were not beneficial uh, to myself or to others. Uh, even though I was a public defender, I left being a victim advocate. I became a public defender. Uh, everything was unsatisfying to me on all sort of quote unquote sides because I realized I didn't believe in sides. And um, also through His Holiness's advice, I sort of stepped onto the path of forgiveness um, and my own meditation journey and um, came to forgive my father who had sexually abused me um, and realized looking back on my own life as I had gone off to law school thinking I would be a prosecutor and, you know, supporting victims and all of this stuff um, that I actually didn't have a prosecutorial bone in my body and that I'd never had. Like I had no interest in what the systems had on offer, right? I didn't want my dad locked up. I didn't want uh, immigration consequences for my family I didn't want to be taken away. Growing up in rural Pennsylvania, um, all the houses that CPS might have put me in uh, didn't speak my language, you know, practice my religion, eat our food, um, or just get down the way we did, right? And uh, so that was 
you know, it was interesting to me. I was like, why was I going to be doing something that I myself would have never opted into as a kid? Mm -hmm. Well, what would I have opted into as a kid? And in the process of studying the Tibetan system of justice prior to Chinese occupation, and there were all of these notions around truth telling and the potential for reconciliation and the fundamental responsibility being to make things right um, once you've caused harm. I was like, oh, this makes sense. And that is when my friend who had been telling me about restorative justice for years, my friend Susan Marcus uh, said, Sujatha, I've been talking about this for years. This is called restorative justice. <laughs> Why don't you start coming to some stuff with me? You know. And so that is how I got introduced to first and foremost, um, the, the Mennonite folks who are doing this good work, right? Howard Zare and, uh, and you know, Lorraine Stutzman on Stutz is not Mennonite herself, but, you know, was practicing restorative justice within those communities. And um, maybe she is Mennonite. Maybe she wasn't raised Mennonite. Anyway, the point is um, those people, uh, really, uh, Tammy Krause, all the folks affiliated with the Zare Institute. Um, and then over time, I started to, uh, cont well, I continued to study Tibetan uh you know, notions of justice and Buddhist, particularly Indian Nagarjuna, like the teachers within the lineage that I practice in, like what were their notions of justice? And then uh, obviously ultimately learning from people like Justice uh, Robert Yazi uh, and other, you know, indigenous teachers uh, the world over uh, who've taught me so much about what it means to both live and practice restoratively. So that was my journey to this point. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> Long winded. <laughs> you know, on this podcast, like balance, like producing a show and conversation going back and forth versus like circle values of like, let them say what they need mm. to say. But there's so many points of like, oh yeah, but like, what about, but what about, and so I'm going to try to remember Go some ahead. of them <laughs> and, 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 and get in there. I think your story about, you know, being a survivor of sexual abuse or a survivor of trauma. And like you said, like many young people, like I want to prevent this from happening for other people, like is a lot of the times where people end up doing their life's work. Right. But when you talked about like, you know, being a victim advocate, being a prosecutor, uh, like being a public defender, like the binary way in which the criminal legal system puts us up against each other. What was it about you that, or what was it about engaging in that system that had you come to the conclusion, like, this is wrong. This is not mm. about sides. This is about our relationships. Mm -hmm. um, was there a moment? Was there an experience? I'm there sure were it was multiple Yeah, things. there were yeah. so many moments and experiences. And yet I kept going thinking, oh, I'm going to fix this from the inside, you know, and I <clears throat> no, um, you know, no shade on those who are making those efforts, you know, um, God bless. <laughs> I really <laughs> like hold, hold you in my heart and the challenges related to that sort of thing. But um, from my side, um, there were a couple times as a victim advocate where I realized that it wasn't, and this was before I'd read Nils Christie's incredible article um, called Conflicts as Property, where he really breaks down that the state the state steals our harms as people. Like instead of it being me versus my father, it would, would have been the state versus my father. Mm -hmm. So I get shafted, right? And, or the state has its own interests. And so to me, um, you know, when there's a crime survivor who's telling me, I don't want to testify against him, or I don't really think that that's, you know, going to be of benefit or whatever, um, or I've actually forgiven him now, or, you know, I was pathologizing people and I was making, um, I, I was drive, helping people drive. This didn't last very long, but I was trying to help people drive towards what the state wanted as an outcome, which was a conviction. Mm -hmm. And I was confusing what a survivor might want. I never thought to ask them what they needed and that we could pre create systems or processes that were designed to meet survivor needs. Right. And so I was really pushing folks to, um, you know, with being angry or being broken, being devastated, being frightened was what was going to look right on the stand. Like there was almost a way in which it was important to keep survivors in the place that was going to lead to the conviction, not mm -hmm. in the place that was going to heal them. So that, that was really horrible. And then on the side of representation, one time I was working on a case where there was a guy who I was working on his appeal and there were a lot of errors in the trial. And he was a sweet kid who got 25 years for something that was very, very close to self-defense and could have, 
could have flown in front of a jury as self-defense. But the judge had made some decisions at trial that had excluded evidence that would have been really good for him. So I knew we could win an appeal and get him a retrial. And he was feeling really, really guilty for having taken this person's life. And they were all connected. They were like related uh, to each other. And he was actually trying to protect, you know, a cousin or something from a domestic abuse situation. But then the fight just kept going and it didn't need to go, you know, as far as it did. So, so what happened was, you know, he wanted to apologize. He really, really wanted to apologize. And I had to advise him to not. And what I knew from having read the trial transcript of all the family wanted at sentencing was an apology. They just wanted to understand like what happened and he couldn't talk and he wouldn't testify. And he would, and I was like, all these people just need to talk. <laughs> you know, like he feels bad. This was, you know, his, his actions weren't unjustified. We could get to a good place, you know, and the family in the end, because he refused to speak was like, we want the death penalty. And it was so not a death penalty. It was like, you know, was shouldn't have even been more than a manslaughter case. And I just felt like I could see it from every place between the trial transcript and, you know, flying to upstate New York at that time to meet with my client in prison. And this baby was like a kid when he was like 18, when this went down and he was looking at 25 years and the whole, and all he, his morality was telling him to apologize. Right. And I was saying that could be used as evidence against you. And no, you can't write that letter. You know, it was just, and the terms of whatever say that you're not allowed to reach out to the other side. Mm -hmm. Like every single part of that whole case was doing everything in the opposite direction of healing. And I was like, nah, can't, can't do this anymore. This is not, I'm not helping, I'm not helping. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, recovering lawyers are some of my favorite people <laughs> to talk to on the podcast. And like, you know, they're some of my greatest teachers, right? Because like you get into this because you are seeking justice, you are seeking truth, you are trying to meet the needs. And growing up in the society that we did, like we've been indoctrinated into thinking like, well, these are the people who are taking care of this problem. But I love that you brought up Christy, where it's like, you know, um, the state has taken all of that away from us, right? And when we think about the ways that that manifests, not just within the context of the criminal legal system, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, you talked about child protective services, or mm -hmm. like, even in schools, or even in the ways that we, like, parent, um, you know, yep. me being a much younger parent, <laughs> um, much less experienced parent <laughs> um, at, at this time, right? I think about, like, what are the ways that we are breaking relationship even more when harm has already occurred by being maybe neglectful of like mm -hmm. the needs of people who have been impacted, not giving opportunities to even ask, right? Deciding paternalistically, like what is right or wrong um, and who's justified and who is not. And right. And that's not what this work is when you, uh, you were working with Susan and we're getting introduced to the Mennonite perspectives, the, uh, indigenous perspectives, um, were there experiences there that were like, oh, this all makes sense to me now? <laughs> I mean, from jump, like yeah. the very first time I was even in a room with folks who were I'm doing these things in this way. And the organization that I first was in some process with, I can't even remember, they were, they were visiting New York and they were from New Orleans and they don't exist anymore. And Susan and I have both tried to figure out who they were, track them down or whatever. And so it's so interesting, but it was just like, I had been in circle once before on 9-11, uh, when the day of actual 9-11, I was living in New Mexico and some friends who were friends with indigenous folks who were not originally from New Mexico, um, held a sweat lodge. They, they, I just remember somebody said something like, somebody's invited us to this thing. They didn't know their names or anything. There's, they said, we heard your country has been attacked and we want to, we want to have a healing circle for you, right? And I went to a sweat um, and it went on for like five hours and we were in that. It was super intense. And I had had a classmate from law school who died in the World Trade Center. I wasn't close with this person, um, but it was, it just was really close to home in that sense. Um, and then when I, and I, and I kind of forgot about that because I was so like in my own trauma and I'd forgotten about that incredible experience of being in circle in a sweat. And then, um, years later when I was in this first restorative justice process where it was, it was a circle again. And I was like, Oh, I've done this. Like, I know what this is. 
Um, and wow, this is really like, you don't just have to do this at a time of trauma. You can do this as a way of learning more about one another. And I talk too much. And so the whole uh, gift of people speaking in turn and being given the opportunity to just drop in and listen felt like the closest thing to meditation as I had experienced. Like it was a meditative way of being together. It was learning to be completely and fully present to someone else's words and feelings and thoughts. And it just felt like a contemplative presence in a way I hadn't experienced in conversation uh, before other than in that sweat lodge, you know? And so um, that was, that was a really beautiful, um, that was a really beautiful, like awakening. Like there's something here that feels right. And I'm not sure how we might use this or use is the wrong word, how we could um, you know, address harm and healing with this yet, but I knew that there was a possibility there. So, yeah, but also just, I mean, I'm a geek too. So like the first time I, I read, um, Howard Jer Zare's Changing Lenses and the book mm -hmm. opens with a discussion of structures of scientific revolution, which was my favorite book. And I was like, what is happening? Like, this is, this is, this guy's talking about paradigm shift in this way. And then to see the paradigm shift applied to the thing that I was so ready to leave, right? The practice of law um, was like mind blowing, you know, the three, the three questions and the reframing of the three questions that was just like, I mean, I still use it all the time. Like I still mm -hmm. say it all the time because I just think it's such a great way of us popping out of, you know, who we center and why, um, as the, and way you know, I, I say that all the time on yeah. this podcast, but do you want to frame it the way yeah. that you share with yeah. people? No, I just say, you know, I, I think this is the way Howard frames it, but instead of asking what law was broken, who broke it and how should we punish them? Uh, we ask who was harmed and what do they need and whose obligation is it to meet those needs? To my mind, without the third question, whose obligation is it to meet those needs? That that it would still be a lovely two questions that we should ask anytime someone, you know, we love or someone we don't love has experienced something. How are they harmed and what do they need? Um, but when we add that third question, whose obligation is it to meet those needs, right? That is where it becomes a justice model for me. Um, and um, yeah, I just really love that framing. I just think it's truly brilliant and it anchors my work all the time. Like, oh, am I doing, am I really doing RJ? You know, uh, am I, am I really getting at those three questions? Uh, that I mean, what, what would I'd... be the alternative to not doing RJ with just those two questions? Well, I think that there's like, I mean, I don't know what people mean by the word restorative, um, standing alone without the word justice, you know, that's a restorative mm -hmm. way to be like, I think that that's the first two questions who was harmed and what do they need? Right. So if I do a, um, healing circle, like there was this a time, well, almost a decade ago at this point where, um, I had a circle, I co-facilitated a circle for South Asian survivors of child sexual abuse. And we spent a lot of time in the first two questions. How are we harmed and what did we need? And, um, but we never got to like, I mean, we might've talked about whose obligation it would have been to meet those needs. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but those obligations weren't met or the people who caused the harm weren't in the circle. And so my work has primarily been in trying to get those folks into the circle. That is where things feel juiciest to me. The possibility of having people who have actually caused the actual harms. Um, and I know we don't have all of them. Like I understand that individual harms exist within this broader structure of structural harms um, mm. and historical harms. Um, and at the same time, I think there is something so revolutionary about the fact that we can live within all these systems of, of structures of oppression and still choose on the individual level to be our best selves. It's almost like, I'm not going to let you do that to me. I'm not going to let you turn me into the thing that I have every right to be for my own survival, you know, to steal from that store, to, you know, be violent back to whatever. Um, I want to be my best self despite all the oppression. And so that to me is the exciting part about, you know, meeting our obligations to make things right when we've harmed people, even yeah. when it's really understandable, we've been set up by the world to cause those harms. And I don't want to discount <laughs> folks who engage in processes where, or 
processes formally or like in the work for themselves that is healing for themselves without Mm -hmm. engaging with the folks who have caused them harm, right? Mm -hmm. When we think about, you know, the needs um, that are present when harm occurs, when uh, sexual violence occurs, when any kind of violence occurs, right? It's not always within the person who's caused harm capacity to be in your presence to make those repairs, right? There are communal ways to do that there are things that you as an individual are responsible for and like you know that can be restorative in nature but i really appreciate you bringing out like i'm not sure like how we do this justice thing uh restoratively without uh those people being involved as you think about like you know your own experience like your father's not here to have um that kind of conversation with like how do you like do you feel like it's Like there's not justice, but you've moved on despite. Yeah. I mean, I don't think justice arises in every circumstance Mm -hmm. and I don't think that justice is possible in every circumstance, right? Like some people cause harm and die without ever (laughs) being Mm -hmm. accountable. Um, And so that, you know, is justice served like to me. And what I mean by justice, I mean um, accountability, like being directly accountable, making things right. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, my father never gets the opportunity to make things right. And But my healing isn't contingent on justice. My healing has never been contingent on justice. My healing can be benefited by justice. If justice had occurred earlier in my life, my healing would have taken a lot less time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? um, but it wasn't a requirement for healing. Justice is one, you know, because ultimately it belongs to me. My, my well-being is ultimately um, mine. And there are other causes and conditions that are required, but the person who's caused the harm isn't always one of them. Yeah, But it's a fast track when it happens. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Like it comes up for me when you say that is, well, two things. One, like similar to like forgiveness, right? Forgiveness is not necessarily, like we can go back to, you know, changing lenses. Restorative justice is not primarily about forgiveness, right? Um, forgiveness can happen if you want, mm-hmm. but like that's that's your journey uh, or the person who's been harmed journey about like how they want to move forward. And I remember you talking about um, in one of the many times that I've heard you speak over the, over the years uh, about that experience that you had um, with the Dalai Lama. And, you know, you talked about like being so angry, right. And not being in a place where you were ready Mm -hmm. to be like, I'm going to (laughs) heal. I'm going to let this go. Right. And he was like, good, be angry. (laughs) Right. Like we can't rush folks into navigating these healing processes. And, you know, of course the criminal legal system, doesn't necessarily give fair speedy trials, but like when it's time to go, like it's expected that you are going to process all of these feelings, emotions, and we're going to meet these needs within the context of like what's going on in this courtroom. And if you need anything outside of that, too bad. So sad. Yep. Yep. (laughs) Good luck. Right. Taking the time to heal, taking the time to accompany people. Right. And so when we're talking about like needs and like whose obligation is it to meet those needs? Like, that's not something that is often possible, like as you were saying. Mm-hmm. And yet here we are doing this work that is good and imperfect, right? This is manifested for you in a lot of different ways with impact to justice across a lot of different organizations. How have you thought about the how have you thought about marrying like the healing as individuals and justice for people who are experiencing oppression? because of the criminal legal system um, throughout your career. So thank you for that really beautiful question. I want to uh, step back for a second and say, you know, I think that that's something that people don't know um, about the Dalai Lama is that like, even though he is often speaking about, you know, forgiveness and moving beyond our anger, there's actually this sweet little book uh, that he is uh, an author of called Be Angry. (laughs) It's Mm -hmm. literally saying like, you know, we have to maintain anger at injustice. The problem where it becomes toxic is if we maintain it towards individuals who are causing that, and then it breeds into hatred. And, you know, maintaining anger at people isn't necessarily beneficial. Maintaining anger at issues sure is. Um, and there's there's a heat and a fire there that can help us move the work forward in the world. So um, it's always good to be reminded of that. And then um, 
With regard to, you know, the, this combination. So, you know, to my mind, like I was saying earlier, like my healing can be expedited by other people's accountability. There is an, in, there is an imbalance that occurs in the world, like the fabric of, you know, fairness gets torn in a way. Um, when someone does something to me that is unacceptable to my body, uh, to my property, uh, to people I love. And um, <clears throat> I myself can ultimately not have the negative consequences of that in my body, in my spirit. You know, I can ultimately become what, what was torn can be mended myself. I can do that myself. Uh, you see people doing it all the time. Um, but, you know, there are causes and conditions that give rise to speedier healing. And particularly when I think about it in the context of sexual harm, one of the things that I carried as a survivor and many survivors I know carried is like, oh, why did this happen to me? Why did he pick me? Or why did she pick me to harm? Why did they pick me to harm? Um, you know, and, and carry a lot of like guilt and feelings of like, um, yeah, self-blame around the harm. And so, and then sometimes the families compound that being like, you shouldn't have worn that that night. You shouldn't have been out. And, you know, you, you, you know, you draw this stuff to yourself. You know, we hear so many survivors telling those kinds of stories um, or this happened to you because you're gay or whatever, right? Like terrible things yeah. get said to survivors sometimes by the people who are supposed to be supporting us. Right. And so, I can't think of something that is more effective in expediting that healing journey collectively when the person who's caused the harm says it in front of your family and community and their own family and community. Mm -hmm. This is my shame, not yours. Like, this is entirely on me. You know, I, yes, what you say happened, happened. And, um, and sometimes even when we, when we're survivors of any kind of harm, we think, I just, I've been burglarized many times. And one time I was sitting in a burglary case I was facilitating and the survivor in that case said to the kid who burglarized her home, well, why'd you pick my house? And he said, cause it was there. And it healed something in me. I was like, oh, it's not cause I painted my house purple and it draws attention to my house. Or like I'm literally trying to find a way to blame myself for my burglaries, right? And when the kid said, cause it was there, cause that's the way I walked home that day, it frees me of the story that I could have controlled this or had anything to do with it, right? And that's even more so in sexual violence cases. Every time I get to hear somebody take responsibility, I'm facilitating a case right now where I'm getting the person ready to, to meet with the people that they harmed and hearing that person take full responsibility for their acts is like, I, I feel something healing in me on a yeah, again, on like a cellular level, every time I get to hear somebody wake up to, oh, wait, that was consent and that was what was required and there wasn't consent and oh my gosh, and I was responsible for that. You know, it just, it keeps chipping away at whatever is residual there with me um, around my own survivor journey. So um, so for me, it's a win, 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 win. When we get everybody doing this off, off the grid or before charges in particular, ideally mm -hmm. before arrest, but if we can find a way for folks to sit down face to face with the people that they harmed, with their families and communities in a way that there's a plan to repair the harm uh, that is completed, right? Instead of the criminal legal system, like we can do that. Um, and we've done that in tons and tons of cases. And um, then that is, that is my dream world. That is the way to do it in my mind. <laughs> yeah, we often find ourselves not being able to solve these problems that are happening all the time because of lack of imagination, right? And, mm -hmm. you know, you and I have been awake to restorative ways of being for a long time. And, you know, many people who are listening to us right now have also been awake to these ideas, right? Um, these ideas aren't new. They're very old. But because of the society that we live in, um, our imagination about, like, how to get justice, how to right wrongs, how to deal with conflict and harm, um, is punitive generally right i think about bringing these ideas of healing and restoration up to people who have been harmed and you know you've over the course of your work have dealt with many people who you know the state or a criminal legal system would label victims right maybe survivors is words that we might be more comfortable with 
what have been conversations where there was initial resistance to like doing a restorative thing? Like, no, that person needs to rot in jail and die. Mm -hmm. Um, And what were some of the ways that you invited them into a process that was ultimately more healing? Yeah. Again, Howard's questions, how are you harmed and what do you need? I, even if in the beginning people are like, I need that person to go to prison. When you keep asking, you know, the same way you asked me in the beginning, the seven, seven times, who are you? Who are you? Who are you? What do you need? What do you need? What else do you need? What do you really need? What do you need? And you get to the need under the need under the need. Prison is never the answer. Like actually needing somebody else to go to prison. Ultimately survivors are not interested in that. Their needs are about themselves. I need to feel safe. I need to know this isn't going to happen again. I need to, well, prison doesn't produce any of those outcomes. Prison doesn't make us safe. Prison doesn't make it not happen again. Right. Um, and I think people know that, right. And, and nobody has ever asked survivors what happened and what do you think needs to happen now? Right. In a way that is really open and generative and really like, how were you harmed spiritually, materially, psychologically, physically, like, and what are the specific needs that flow from each of those things and other things? Like, let's be broad and expansive. And in your dream world, what happens now, right? We don't, so those are what my meetings with survivors are like. Well, first I just let them vent and vent Mm -hmm. and vent like the first many, and I don't try to correct anyone if they're like, I need to see this person locked up. Ultimately, pretty quickly, I'm going to have to be like, well, then I'm not the person you should be working like the district attorney's office has a victim advocacy thing. And you could Mm -hmm. go back and try to do that, but that's not what I do. Um, And and if you work really well with survivors, I think very rarely the answers are punitive at all. You know, they're not like, I need this person to have these things taken away from them or their, their happiness limited in these ways or their freedom limited in these ways. Maybe there's some notion that, you know, oh my gosh, is this person going to keep doing this? And so that that can be challenging. Um, but yeah, that's that's a little bit of it. One of the one of the, my favorite exercises with folks is actually just getting them to think about a time in which they were harmed. And more broadly, like when I'm doing workshops, I'm like, tell mm. us about a time in which you were harmed and let's let's make some post-it notes about what you needed then and what you need now. Okay, now tell me about a time in which you caused a harm, right? What did you need at the time it happened? And what do you need today? And they make them two different colors, like the times you caused harm, the times you experienced harm. And then we started like do an art project on the wall with the post-it notes, right? In all the years I've done this, I have seen thousands and thousands and thousands of these post-it notes. And I have done this exercise, even with district attorneys and police officers and whatever, right? No one has ever written on any of those post-it notes, the word prison. I have never seen that word on a post-it note. What did you need? No one, no, like I make people drop into a time in which they experienced a harm. And no one's ever said for the, some people have said revenge. Some people have said, I needed pepper spray, right? But nobody has said that they needed prison. Yeah. They'll say like, I need to be away from that person. Like I can't be around that person, but that doesn't necessarily look like, um, in an eight by six by eight box for 23 hours a day. Right. That's exactly right, David. Right. That's exactly it. And I think, you know, it's just interesting to me. Now, now somebody's going to come and get them on my training. So write the word prison on it, post it so they can be the first one. <laughs> I swear to you, I've never seen one. Uh, I've never yeah, one you know, when we, we do that exercise as well. And I think about, right, yeah, revenge comes up a lot, right? Mm-hmm. I need them to hurt. Mm-hmm. I need them to understand the pain that they caused me, yeah. right? But that doesn't necessarily look like, you know, captivity, yeah. And I would say, honestly, that I see fewer of those. I see, there's like two, like this last one, I just did this um, last week. And uh, there were 60 people the first day and 80 people the second day. And three of the post-it notes said something that smelled like uh, to get back at them. And those were always on the post-it notes that are about what I needed then. And if enough time passes, the word revenge doesn't last. You know, it's yeah. interesting. So, <laughs> so that is, so, so what do we need? What do we really need? Um, and it's, it's usually not punitive at all. No, that I really level. honor the ones that are like, I needed my bike back. I needed my stuff. Back. I like the material ones. I'm like, that's right. And that is a thing that we can work on, right? Getting your stuff back or whatever, right? Like, yeah. I like that addition of the 
what did you need then and versus what do you need now? Because, mm-hmm. you know, it's really helpful to help people think about like, you know, when I'm in crisis, because somebody is like deeply hurt me in a moment, right? I might, I, like, I might need just like time and space to process <laughs> before like I get to say like, oh, like this is what would actually like be healing for me. And like, you know, of course with, in my experience, people are reflecting on things that like they're years away from <laughs> right, when right, right. We're, we're asking for them. And like, you know, the, the things that we're able to be like more reflective on, like that's just a uh, human journey, human development. Like we were generally very resilient and adaptive to, you know, the things that are going on around us. And we find other ways to get those needs met at least some of the time, even mm-hmm. if it's not like that person giving us a public apology yep. um, and talking about like being accountable. And I think, you know, when we think about restorative justice as a way of being more expansively, that proactive relationship building, uh, strengthening relationships rooted in equity and trust, like you were talking about, right? We just don't have to have circles when there's conflict and harm. Like we can talk about um, how we want to be together, like consensus-based decision-making, mm. uh, check-ins, or like all, all of those things. Like I'm most familiar with your work at Impact Justice, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so when I think about that work, like what were the community building aspects mm-hmm. of that that mm-hmm. aren't just focused on building harm? And especially as like somebody who is like leading a team, how do you continue to like uphold those ethics, uphold those values as you do work that is so much about like navigating conflict and harm. Mm-hmm. Well, I would say you can't, you know, you can't get to, I don't remember who, who said this, this is many people say this, you can't get to a good place in a bad way. Right. Mm-hmm. And so um, I think that it's really important to operate restoratively in the way in which you run an organization and way, way in which you help other communities roll out uh, restorative justice processes. Right. Um, and, you know, consensus is challenging, right? And everything doesn't happen always entirely by consensus. And every single thing doesn't need to be done in a circle. Yes. But, uh, or you'll never like it, your budget finished or, you know, some things, but um, like that, right? But at the same time, like having meaningful engagement and feedback um, and sitting in circle with your staff and your team, right? Like, um, and, when you're trying to help a community start something somewhere new, like starting by sitting in circle with them and hearing what are the needs here? Like what, what, what would this look like to you? Like co-imagining it with people and then saying, here's, here's what we do. And this is the gift and skills we have. Let's see if there's some alignment here. Let's see if this is, you know, and maybe it isn't, Oh, you guys are really, really wedded to doing this in a way where people had to plead guilty to restorative justice. Well, that's not how we roll. So we're not going to, we, we we love you and we hope you succeed in things that help your community grow. But that crosses our sort of line, right? And like, and being in deep dialogue around that sort of stuff. And at the same time, really, you know, understanding who we are in the relationship to the work and, and also really understanding what the community's desires and needs are, right? And so um, it's just about, it's about engaging in the same ways that the process might look, right? You got to actually build it that way too. So that is a huge part of, of the process. Um, and understanding that it's not all going to go well. Like there are places where we tried to start things that I don't think are, it, that have stayed in alignment with what it is that we had hoped for uh, collectively or that had been originally uh, aspired to. So um, perfection is a very dangerous thing um, and, it, and it can make for a lot of really painful relationships. Um, so that's hard. Uh, understanding that, you know, things are going to go off the rails sometimes and then how do we find our way back? But Again, over and over again, being in meaningful dialogue, keeping in deep relationship, loving everybody, and um, learning how to make space to love one another, um, including our systems partners and our right. And and that work is less and less of what I do today. But I still keep in touch with a whole bunch of folks who you know do jobs that I could never do, um, are in positions that I could never be in, and keeping my heart and mind open to where it is that they are uh, in the work that they're doing is really, really, really important without budging about what it is that I do and how I show up. Right. So I I thought that answers the question. (laughs) Uh, Yes. Yes. What it, what it sparks for me is, you know, as an abolitionist, right. I can get my head around like the work that you're, the work that people who are, actively engaged in systems who are like actively like prosecuting actively like sentencing, right? Like 
you can do that in a way that is harm reductive. And like, that's very meaningful for a person who's experiencing um, who's, who's right in front of you in that moment. Right. And we, right. We don't want to belittle that. Right. And I know many of those people like in district attorney's office, like quote unquote progressive prosecutors who like espouse abolitionist beliefs, like outside of like the construct of those the the rigidity of their job and like <laughs> yeah, right right I didn't name anybody um, and I and like I in some ways like I I want you there right because the alternative to you being there is someone else who doesn't have those values and more people not getting their needs met more people ending up incarcerated more over like you know harm being per, uh, perpetuated what was it what was a breaking point for you? It was like, I can't do this, right? I can't be this advocate who is making the thing, making the change from the inside mm-hmm. as a mm-hmm. What was mm-hmm. it for you that like made you break out of that? I think that for me, um, I feel really comfortable with, um, you know, the word dharma, uh, it means to hold, dharma means to hold. Mm-hmm. And it's like to be held within a very specific, that's just, me, right? Like, I like having, like, this is the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path, and these are the 10 virtuous actions and the 10 non-virtuous actions. And it really suits the part of me that still is lawyer brainy, right? Mm -hmm. And so for me, creating the parameters in relationship to the present system, that I think that if we go beyond, we are not beneficial. Mm -hmm. In the long goal of ending mass criminalization, ending racialized mass criminalization, when are we, as David Anderson Hooker often asks, like letting the steam out of the pressure cooker just so the thing can keep doing cooking, cooking the people yeah. of color, right? And so for me, when I look at outcomes, I look at cost benefit analysis on how much we're paying for programs to how many people are we serving? What are the actual recidivism rates of the program? Like, I felt like the pre charge line is unbudgeable. And that to me, it just, it helps me be really, really clear. I'm like, once we, we assign attorneys and have court dates, this is me. Once we assign attorneys and have court dates, then we are popping into adversarialness. Mm -hmm. Then we are truly in the system. Now I'm not saying that like an arrest record doesn't make you in the system in some way. Of course it does. On the level of restorative justice, once we cross a certain line, then it is binary. Then we have ascribed labels of the accused and the defendant and the da da da, right? And we don't want to, to my mind, then we're doing a lot of cleanup of another system's mess. And so I believe that if everybody said, we're going to do it this way, that we could all keep it before that line, right? Um, and so that, that's just the line I drew, right? For me, I don't, I also fundamentally believe that this is a uh, this is about the power of families and communities to understand that we can heal it ourselves. We got us. If you reach the point where you are then in in a court having to tell a judge, we did this, now dismiss the case, and the judge has the power to decide yes or no, or the judge gets to say, oh, we're going to tweak the plan in this way to make it more in alignment with the law, then you're compromising the empowerment of the people who mm-hmm. came up with this plan themselves. And so that, for me, those are some reasons why I don't believe in doing things in a way that requires further you know, decision-making over us by state actors. Then I think we run into Mills Christie problems of who owns the harm, right? I want the harm to always be owned by the people who experienced it. And so once we give that much power to the state to decide whether our restorative process was good enough, um, et cetera, then I think we've, we've got, we've, we've strayed into areas that aren't Restorative justice. It could be restorative. So you were asking about um, how did I decide the degree to which I think, I think the general sense I was getting in the question was like about the degree to which I've decided that I work within systems or in tandem with systems. And that's about as far as I can sidle up to a system is yeah. uh, the notion that, um, you know, once there are deciders over us, right? It's like it, once we've lost the we got us, 
right? And we are dealing with people deciding whether or not what we decided was good enough. Um, if the crime survivor, you know, or the person who's experienced the harm and the person who's caused the harm and the, and the people who know and love and support them and are going to be helping them uh, move forward in a good way are all in agreement that this plan is good enough, then I'm not really sure why we think the state with its astronomical recidivism rates is in a better position to tell us what to do. Right. And so, um, that is my general feeling about that kind of yeah. stuff. That makes sense. Yeah. I mean, and I think that the other thing that gets me about like some, I'm not going to generalize and say all, but some, uh, quote unquote, restorative initiatives within the context of the criminal legal system are for quote unquote crimes, right? They are violations of the law, right? But they are victimless, right? The yeah. person who is being harmed is the person who did the thing, right? Whether it is like, and I think like on some level, like theft, like shoplifting, property destruction, possession um, of either a firearm or, you know, drugs, right? Like those things are being done by people in crisis, right? Yeah. And so to put people through like, a restorative process like who are the, who are we restoring to like is the state is the state is society taking responsibility for creating the conditions for putting that person in those situations no like we're just putting this person on an improvement plan and like hoping for the best i don't know that i would call that wholly restorative yeah. um and some of these things are happening and so like again yeah. to the folks who are like doing this work that's harm reductive blessings but are we giving more power to the state to lord over us like yeah. and just being able to stamp the letters rj or like god forbid like tj right on on their efforts yeah well the state should get the words tj out of their mouth entirely right yeah, yeah. <laughs> i say that with love and respect but please um don't don't i mean that's literally not that's literally the opposite of what transformative justice is about so yeah. um so there's that. And then um, I think, you know, for us, there was this question of net widening, right? Um, mm. We made the choice early on to only work with high, high level misdemeanors and felonies uh, because this is where, you know, the process is most honored as well. Um, and we took this tip from New Zealand, right? Aotearoa, where they, um, anything lower level actually needs a, needs like the kid, if the kid is doing, graffiti um, on people's buildings that's putting them out, right? Like they don't want the side of their house tagged over and over and over again. Um, yeah, there's a person who's harmed there, right? Or even in theory, right? Like, you know, it depends on the size of the store, right? And what kind of loss prevention they have. But if, you know, somebody is stealing from someone's mom and pop shop, like that's not okay, right? Like that's somebody's bottom line. But the truth is, is that those kids are not, like it's really hard to think of the circumstance under which, you know, the person who is running this mom and pop shop maybe is going to take time off when they're so busy and they're just making ends meet themselves to sit down in a circle with this kid. Um, mm -hmm. That kid needs something else. <laughs> yeah. And and so in New Zealand, you know, they don't they don't send cases like that to restorative justice. It's got to be pretty serious to go to restorative justice. Restorative justice is a serious thing, um, and it's for serious stuff. And the power of the impact of hearing from the person who you harmed really applies in situations that are serious. Uh, but if you're trying to get Target's loss prevention team to show up at a circle, like eh, it's just garbage, you know, and then, and to me, it just seems like a publicity stunt on all fronts. Um, and I'm not saying that the, the people don't come with good heart about what it is um, that they um want to see happen. They want to see something positive move forward in the world. I get it. I think people come with a lot of fear about what it would look like to do the more serious cases where I have more fear about the low level stuff because it doesn't turn out well. Like nobody feels like you've made this big production out of something because a circle is a big deal. Like it takes sometimes a really long time to prepare people to be ready to be accountable. And it takes a lot of courage to show up and meet with the person who's harmed you. And it takes a lot of courage to show up to meet with the people who you've harmed, right? And and, and you do all of the stuff for some little thing that the person isn't even taking that seriously because it's not that serious. Like it just, it, it devalues a short of justice to my mind. So um, these are some of the many reasons why we sort of drew the line at more serious stuff. 
um, and hope that people continue to do that. Um, I think that it honors the process. It honors, honors the modality, the way of being. Um, and it doesn't let us pat ourselves on the back for doing something that's actually not changing anything. The other question that people are often asking when we're thinking about applying restorative justice to the criminal legal system, to addressing harm and conflict, like, hey, this is a lot of work. This is serious. Like, is this scalable? Like, how are we equipping people? Right. And I, I do take those critiques to heart, right? Because I think within the United States, let's just talk about the United States. They're probably less, I'll be generous and say like, they're less than 5,000 people who you would trust to facilitate like mm-hmm. a repair of harm process between folks. Right. Mm-hmm. And so if we're advocating for these ways of being to manifest in the world, I think it's a, it's, I think it's a legitimate critique to say, yeah, but like you can't actually do this because there aren't enough people to like make this happen. How do you respond to that? Yeah. Yet there aren't enough yeah. people yet. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. There are not enough people yet. Um, and so let's keep experimenting. Let's keep building the experiments and let's keep, um, Introducing more and more and more people to um, how to do this and how to do this in a good way. Let's keep inviting other people to co-facilitate with us and building our confidence. I mean, there are people who I used to co-facilitate with in the beginning where I was like, they'll never get it. They're not, this is not their jam. And now there are people who, you know, I would 10,000% trust to, yeah, to, to, to do the work. So it's going to take time. It took us a couple hundred years to build mass criminalization to the, into the, the monster it is today. Mm-hmm. So what will it take to build something gorgeous into the beauty that it will be someday? Um, I always say the seed never sees the flower, right? We have to like hold the urgency of ending mass criminalization tomorrow <laughs> with the understanding that it's going to take hundreds and hundreds of years. The paradigm shift is a really good thing to return to in thinking about this. Um, The primary paradigm shift that I think is described in structures of scientific revolution is the worldview that the earth was in the center of the solar system versus the sun. Mm. And so when people first started to say, um, Hey, the earth is in the middle, you know, it was punished. It was punishable to say that, and uh, it was shut down, and it took a good 200 years for the world to come to consensus. And there's still probably some people out there who think the earth is in the middle, right? But it took 200 years, mm-hmm. and there were great consequences for those who knew the truth. And so I see the things the same way. I believe that the sun in the middle is restorative and transformative and indigenous peacemaking approaches to justice. And that is the sun in the middle. That's the sun in the middle. It, and, you know, um, everybody else still running around their putative view with the earth in the middle. And I think it's going to take a long time for us to help the world shift uh, to the, to the, to the better way of doing things. Right. And there are some societies that always knew that the sun was in the middle. (laughs) You know, this is a Western question, right. Of the Western um, and, and, and it was based on a very particular view and it, and there were entrenched views that were connected to it. Right. And there's still some remnants. Like we still think planets go retrograde and stuff. And when that's, that's an earth centric view. Right. Um, and, and we still, and you know, there's some information there that's useful. <laughs> you know, Mercury going retrograde is thing, um, from us in our earth centric view. Right. But, um, but yeah, it's going to take a t- some time. You know, it's like Arundhati Roy says, you know, another world is possible. You know, on a quiet day, I can hear her breathing, you know, mm. um, she's on her way. You know, uh, I love, I love that. And to have the humility that, yeah, I don't need to see the fruits of my labor. I just need to be putting the pieces in place. And one of those pieces is data. Like, I'm really grateful that um, my previous organization, Impact Justice, invested time and energy into um making sure that we could show the system that our system works better. Our, our system isn't a system. Our approach works better. Um, these are the kinds of things that we're chipping away. Um, and, and another Can thing. Can you say I, more on our system isn't a system? Our system isn't the system. 
isn't a system. I don't believe in restorative systems of justice. I don't believe in systems of justice. I believe in community families and communities and people having uh, available to them places to go to when harm has happened, but it's not like a system that is being imposed from above. Um, I think systems are easily corrupted. And so for me, um, having available opportunities for heal conversation and healing is what we want to be growing in the world. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, <sighs> there's so much possibility, right? You t said like, it's going to take years, centuries. Um, what are some of the things that you're seeing presently? Some of the things that maybe you're a part of that really excites you? Uh, one of the things I'm involved in that super excites me is the CHAT project, Collective Healing and Transformation in Richmond, California. Uh, we are working with families and uh, people who are in a relationship um, around intimate partner and sexual violence. Uh, people can contact CHAT directly um, and uh, not not through the state, like not call the cops, not, you know, you can just come in and, and or, you know, call and contact them and, and see you know, if there's somebody available there to help you think through a restorative justice approach towards um, an uh, ongoing or past uh, intimate partner, sexual, domestic violence, harms that have occurred in, in your family. And um, I do a little bit of co-facilitating with that. I've done a lot of, you know, sort of helping people think through how to do these processes. Um, and I'm just really grateful to get to work with Chelsea and Selene around um, that work. They're incredible. You should have them on the show sometime. They're incredible. Um, and, uh, that gives me incredible hope. Like I just, um, yeah, did the work that is continuing on at impact justice, um, with the restorative justice project. I'm super impressed. They've, uh, had some hiccups through the, um, through transitioning through leadership changes and then, um, the pandemic, you know, has been hard on everybody. And I know that that's true of all of us doing restorative justice work and the thoughtfulness and care with which notions of how to do RJ online through the pandemic, you know, all of this, all of this innovation that's been required has been so impressive to me. So um, I just believe in the next generation. I, I think one of the things that I feel most moved by all the time is the final sort of this finally we're awakening to the fact that gender is a continuum. Um, it just, it's one of the most entrenched binaries that we have. Right. Um, and moving beyond binary notions of us, them, right, wrong, good, bad, like Victor vanquished gladiator court kind of thinking requires other levers to be moved. And I think that us understanding that there aren't two genders, uh, is it really like that that is that we're awakening to that uh, as a society is something that I get really excited about. You don't know what all the little pieces moving um, are going to actually help. Uh, the paradigm shift approach actually isn't, it's not linear. It sort of plugs along and everyone's like the, the sun's in the middle, the, the earth's in the middle, the earth's in the middle, the earth's in the middle. And then there's like a, it's like a step ladder where it like shoots up. Suddenly it's like, oh, here we are, we've arrived at this new place. Um, and we don't know what the tipping point is. You never know what's going to be that thing. And so for me, my uh, optimism and my curiosity and my excitement comes from like, what's it going to be that gets mm -hmm. us to stop making enemies of each other? What's it going to take for us to stop seeing that we are really, truly interdependent? Um, it could be it could be anything uh, that really starts to tip the world over in some new way. That's exciting to me. <laughs> yeah. The, the cynic in me, the, the observer of the world as I've experienced it over the past really like 10 years, but you know, course of my life um, says like a lot more people getting murdered, a lot more people being harmed a lot more people like being close enough to harm to be like, Oh, this has to change. And there are other like more generative <laughs> ways that those realizations happen, but so much of the awakening um, or the, the shifts happen in moments of like intense pain um, or at the expense of like the most marginalized people in our society and communities. Um, 
<laughs> and so like I have a hard time receiving that as like and I'm energized by the possibility because like it's inevitably going to be more harm more harm more harm and you know that was already going to happen um how do we keep going mm-hmm. there's nothing else we can do I suppose mm-hmm. <laughs> there is nothing else we can do my friend the harm has been here it has always been with us and to be frank it is really bad now and it has always been really bad I do not believe that it is worse today. I believe that income stratification is growing, but I think that the levels of desperation and horror that people lived with in the past were as extreme, if not more extreme than the ones that we live with today, depending on what society you're living in. And so, and I'm not trying to blow sunshine and be like, it's better than it was. Black people can vote now. Like what? No, I'm not saying that. (laughs) Please no, I am not saying that. Um, but there are there are um, there are fundamental shifts that have occurred that are truly beneficial, and more importantly, it's always been bad. Like so, for me as a Buddhist, the first noble truth is that like the way we are currently experiencing life is suffering, mm. right? It is the fundamental ground that we stand on. So long as we operate in unenlightened ways, we are suffering. This is suffering. This disconnect from understanding the way in which the universe operates causes us to have, you know, attachment to some and aversion towards others that, whether humans or experiences, that cause us to harm each other. Like this shit is going to be happening until we have collective liberation. That is exactly what is happening. So it doesn't surprise me that people are killing each other. It doesn't surprise me that people are sexually abusing each other, like sexually abusing children. Like that, this does not surprise me. This is the current nature of our lack of collective liberation. Um, and so that is really hard sometimes, David. And so we got to like take good care of ourselves, right? So for me, it's about keeping, you know, the glass more than half full with the joy and the beauty and the happy and the, you know, whatever, whether it's, you know, the barbecues and the porches or the going to the temple or the dancing or the just loving on each other, taking breaks and being whole and, you know, um, and, and just holding that, right. Imagining seeing the future. Um, you know, there's a lot of this in, um, uh, Mariam Kaba's new book, let this radicalize you. Like it's just, there's just this joy is like hope is a discipline, right? It's what she says. Mm-hmm. And all of this joy and beauty and love and connectivity, so critical uh, to being able to move forward because you're absolutely right. Like, and especially as we continue to populate this planet, like there's literally statistically just more murders, right? There's more, sure. harm. like <laughs> there's just more of us. So there's more of us to hurt each other. Right. Um, and so that, that is true. Uh, and I, I'm not trying to dismiss that. It's, um, it's yeah. I mean, you said it yourself from the from the first words out of your mouth. Is what's the option? What is the alternative? Is it to lie down and take it? Is it to is it to give up? Is it to just make a lot of money myself and have my little fiefdom of my little family and get a nice car? Like I don't <laughs> like that. Doesn't sound good to me. That that won't. It, Oh, for those people for whom it makes them happy. Okay, fine. But first of all, I was wondering, are they really happy? And number two, it won't make me happy. I know myself well enough to know that it won't. So no options, mm-hmm. no options, but to continue to move forward in a good way. <laughs> yeah. Um, in the past, for, for listeners, uh, we did this segment that we're actually going to run as a separate uh, podcast, uh, Restorative Justice Reflections, because um, you just spoke to something and, you know, because of your uh, experiences with the, uh, His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, um, you have unique insight too. And um, the transition that I'm going to make is that, you know, the world, I don't think, say, the same as you, like, I don't think the world is actually worse. We just see more of it, right? <gasps> Social media, the news That's is right. per- producing, um, putting all of these things in our faces, insidious sources, and sometimes just like our own collective outrage are like building more and more and compounding on each other. And so on a uh, restorative justice reflections episode that is going to air separately from this, we're going to, um, 
reflect on the recent controversy uh, with His Holiness the Dalai Lama um, um, asking a little boy to suck on his tongue. But that's going to be aired separately. <laughs> okay, so transparently, dear listeners, we just recorded an episode of Restorative Justice Reflections that is going to air next week. So look forward to that. But we're at the place in the podcast where I'm going to ask you the questions that everyone answers when they come on. So in your own words, define restorative justice. Mm. I can't in my own words because I'm such a huge fan of Howard Zare's words on this one. <laughs> That's what I generally do uh, is that I, I refer to his, you know, um, uh, process to involve to the degree possible uh, everyone who's got a stake in a specific uh, situation of harm and uh, in order to collectively identify and address harms, needs and obligations in order to put things as right as possible. I mean, I just I don't really feel like trying to improve on that. I mean, sometimes I do. Sometimes I think, um, I think that there's something to be named about. He talks about a continuum of restorative processes. And I'm always like, what would, what is the, how would we define the most, um, what the most restorative end of that continuum? Right. And to me, it's about face-to-face -face dialogue, um, and participatory decision-making in which folks who've caused harm are lovingly held directly accountable to crime survivors' self-identified needs. Or I don't even like the words crime survivors, to, to survivor self-identified needs. So I guess that's my definition of restorative justice if I have one. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. As you've been doing this work, what has been an oh shit moment? It can be a time where you're like, oh, I made a mistake. I wish I had never done that. I've learned better. Or it can be like an aw shit. Yeah, I did that. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> the oh shit and the aw shit. Okay. All right. One of each, maybe. I mean, I've worked on a few cases where I have worked in tandem with the system or in tandem with the circumstances that have caused the process to be more rushed. And I know better. Like I'm like, that took two, that would have taken two or three circles, not one. But we mm. only had this much time, or we only had, or we were up against this. And the up against this compromises the work. And I don't like doing that to folks. So that that is that's a regret that I've often had. Um, not often. I've only I've only had that situation come up a couple of times. And it just shortchanges the storytelling and it shortchanges the time and space of breathing room to be able to hold sometimes, especially in murder cases, sexual violence cases, like we want to make more space for that. Right. So that's, that's one. Um, and then, yeah, you know, I, I don't know. I just, every, every sexual violence case that I get to do when people are able to say directly to the person they sexually violated, um, yeah, that, you know, this was on me and I should have, I should have understood that that was not what you wanted. And, um, I, you know, I should have known better and what can I do now? And I don't even want to put it on you to have to tell me, but I also want to leave space for you to like when they just get it right, when the person who's caused harm gets it right, I feel like, oh my God, like my friend Amita Swadhan, um, they run, they are co, co director of this thing called Mirror Memoirs, which is, um, an organization that is, um, for, uh, queer and trans, uh, BIPOC survivors of child sexual abuse. Um, and I myself identify as queer and, uh, Amita has, has on their Facebook page this quote, be who you needed when you were younger. And when I am, helping people, um, you know, take responsibility for what they did. I feel like I am living into that, you know, I'm like, mm. Oh, I am being who I needed when I was younger. And, um, and when I, when, when I'm facilitating those, those moments where I get to see, uh, people take responsibility directly, there was one particular case I worked on, uh, where it was like a young teenage girl and, and an older boy in her high school who had sexually harmed her. And I mean, he, knocked it out of the park in terms of taking responsibility. And she found her power and totally told him off. And he sat there through it and got it and said all the right things. And it totally diffused her rage. And she, her mom told me in the weeks following that dialogue, like she was just like, she said she became an even more empowered person than she was before the assault. <clears throat> 
She said, you never want your kid to be sexually assaulted, but also like, I don't even know who she is today. Like she is next level empowered young woman. And I, I just, I'm like, guy helped with that. I helped hold that space. And um, that case to this day makes me so grateful for when I think about who I was when I was her age, oh my gosh, I was a mess. And I felt in many ways really alone. I had some good people around me, including my sister, uh, who was really holding it down for me and knew what I had lived through. But man, that is like, that is like next level. <laughs> it's like, my work is done here in the universe. Like, you know, that. Um, and then sometimes when I'm starting to storytell around it and doing some writing, writing a book right now, and sometimes I, I hit a, I, I nail a paragraph where I feel like that is it. That is, that's the paradigm shift thinking uh, that I want to get out there in the world. And I'm like, oh yeah, that's good. <laughs> so I'll ask this here. Um, uh, I was in conversation with Donna Harati um, mm. last night um, in preparation for having this conversation with you. And she was like, oh. make sure she talks about the book. Um, oh, how cute. <laughs> so, you know, um, Donna. What, yeah. <laughs> what is, uh, what, what's coming? What's, what, what are you working on? I'm working on a book about forgiveness and restorative justice ends up in there and there will be another book on restorative justice at some point. But this book is just um, the book that I am imagining uh, putting out there in the world is um, and that I've done some some writing on um, is a book about actually starting when I was, you know, in my in my early 20s and really just a hot mess and miserable and uh, my journey to healing myself and to trying to find my way out of the rage and habitual responsiveness instead of not responsiveness, reactiveness instead of responding uh, that I was living with back then and how ineffective it was for me and everyone around me and how I found my way to, um, to forgiveness and to restorative justice. Um, and those are two really, really different things, right. As we talked about earlier in, the, in this episode, but um um, yeah, so it's the story of meeting his holiness and receiving his advice about how it is that um, rage doesn't have to be the work that constantly fuels everything I do and how it led me to, you know, both forgiveness of my father, but then also more importantly, not more importantly, equally importantly, uh, a life in restorative justice. And, um, and then some short essays, I think, is the way I'm conceptualizing it now about what some of those major takeaways were. Um, it's not a self-help book. It's kind of like a memoir and essays about the short memoir uh, that help deepen that understanding. So that, and the title of the book is called Angry Long Enough. And I hope that that will, that's what I'm imagining the title to be today. Um, I hope that it will express the importance of having been angry at some point. There was a time for anger. And then there was a time in which uh, I wanted to have other types of fuel, cleaner fuel. It's like solar instead of, um, <laughs> you know, other kinds of fuel uh, to, to fuel the work. And so that that's what the book is. And, um, I like writing. I didn't know, uh, cause I am so out there doing it in the world all the time that I don't, I haven't, I've been taking more and more time to actually uh, engage in the writing process. And I joined this really amazing thing called the unicorn authors club. Um, and it is like for BIPOC writers and their allies to, um, to, to, to work on, to work on a book. And, uh, it's been incredible. And so I feel really, really grateful for this time and the space, uh, that I've been afforded in my life right now uh, to have been able to step away from the day-to-day -day work. I'm still doing it. I'm still, you know, working a little bit with chat and facilitating some cases and definitely doing trans. Just why I saw Donna was because I was down in LA um, mm -hmm. uh, with Homeboy Industries and doing some, how do we start to think about the possibilities of restorative justice and domestic violence in that community? Uh, really grateful that people still keep asking me to do a few things here and there, but um, thinking about a shift towards being more of a paradigm shift communicator, that that would be my job somehow, like somebody give me that title, paradigm shift communicator, <laughs> whether it's through books or other types of media, um, trying to get, get the word out that there are other ways of being and we can find our ways there. And it is like that other world is possible. Um, and we can actually start to imagine it, plan for it, create it, co-create it. Um, that's, that's what I want to do next. Beautiful, beautiful. And so when that book comes out, you know, this is a request and I'm not taking no for an answer. Uh, yes, I'm taking no for an answer. <laughs> but like, you're going to come back on and, and plug that when it comes time. That's funny. That was not, that no. was so rude. No, but, it's so great. Just don't, you're not allowed but, to say that to a sexual violence survivor. That's <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Don't cut that. That's funny. Yeah, Paulo, you have to leave that. <laughs> you have to leave that in there. Egg on my face. Egg all over That's my gorgeous. face. It's gorgeous. I love it. Well, you don't have to take no for an answer because my answer is yes. I will happily come back and, and tell you all about the book when it is done. So it might be a minute um, because I am moving forward in a good way. I am attending to my own uh, my own, uh, the pace of the wisdom is sort of being spun out of my engagement with my memories and, um, and learning how to tell really hard things in beautiful ways, I think is the whole work of restorative justice. So what does it look like to write a book in a restorative justice way, you know, to, to spin the beauty, um, out of the horrors, um, that is, that's our work and we can, we can do that. We can do that on the page. We can do that with each other. So Yay. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, you get to sit in circle with four people, oh. dead or alive. Mm -hmm. Who are they? And what is the question you ask the circle? I would um, say that the four people are uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Vandana Shiva, who are both alive, uh, and... Um, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, just because, I mean, the two of them together was such a beautiful thing. And also just because he is who he is. And uh, Harriet Tubman. And so those are my four. And I think um, what I would ask them about would be about telling me the source of your confidence to continue doing the sacred, beautiful work that you do. What is the source of your confidence? I think that, and I would ask them that because it's what I need. I need to be more confident. Uh, I I still live with, um, somebody said the other day, imposter syndrome isn't accurate because those of us who have it think that we don't have imposter syndrome. We think we're actually imposters. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, I don't have imposter syndrome because I'm the actual imposter. But I mean, it's it's not that severe, but there's still some residual I'm in my way. And so the question would be around the confidence that causes them to be out there in the world, not in their own way. Right? They just, they, they, all four of them strike me as beings who uh, were, were unimpeded by any of their own shit <laughs> right? for like this incredibly powerful, positive forward movement. And so that is, that I, that is what I would ask them. I think a lot of us have a lack of confidence, a lack of self belief, or other related things that are stopping us from being the forces of nature that we all are. And so, those are four who seem to have figured that one out. And uh, I would like to know more. I would like to know more about that and their journey to that place. Maybe they came out of the womb that way, all four of them. I don't know, but yeah. Um, but that would be good to know. So what happens often on this podcast is I turn the question back to the guest, right? Mm. Where do you get your confidence to shine as you do? Mm. But I want to answer and maybe speak to you the way that I started our conversation. One, because like, one, I imagine like all of those people will tell you all of the times where like they weren't confident and yep. like experience like lots of the same things that you're experiencing as you've navigated the world. But like, Sujatha, like, take a step back and acknowledge that me, like, someone who you've met twice and now have spent, like, significant time with, like, Yay. has so been impacted yeah. <laughs> by, you know, the work that you've done. And, like, I'm not even, like, the person who has been in space, like, where you're facilitating, like, these amazing healing processes so seemingly confidently, right? Confidently enough that the people in those spaces trust you enough to like bear their souls, bear their vulnerability, their hurt, their pain, um, their aspirations for wanting to be better, to do better. Um, where does that confidence come from you to do that? Mm -hmm. Knowing that it's not about me. When I am in the moment of facilitating those dialogues, this is a beautiful question, by the way. Thank you so much for making me engage in this process. So I am supremely confident when I'm bringing people together uh, for these guys. You can't not be. You can't be trepidatious when you're bringing somebody to talk to the person who killed their child. Like there can't be any, you have to totally, you know, be solid and certain 
And I am when I'm doing these processes. And yeah, because it's not about me. I am doing this for them. A hundred percent for all of them equally. And so that, that is one of the biggest sources. It's not about me. And um, yeah, I think my other source of confidence comes from my daily practice, right? I have a really beautiful visualization that I do six times a day that involves um, an ocean of, you know, life-giving milk that is growing a tree in, the, in infinite space. And it's got these 11 layers in it and, and, these, and, and layers of beings, all these Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and gods and goddesses, and they're all doing incredible work to make the world beautiful, to make the universes beautiful and safe and filled with loving kindness and compassion. And um, I hang out with them six times a day um, and, you know, they guide me and, and I see them, you, you really visualize them as alive, like you, they're breathing and some of them are talking with each other and they, they're going off to be of benefit and returning and reporting back what happened out there in this crazy samsaric existence we're all in. And so, um, so I know that they love me and all beings equally and infinitely. I do actually in the core of my being know that. Um, and so when I, I would like to live every day, all day uh, in that, in that level of confidence, but I at least do it three, 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 six times a day. I get it in. And I think that juices me up to, <laughs> to go to a podcast, even though there's always a question like I have a shame spiral afterwards. Like, Oh, did I talk too much? Did I say the wrong things. Like what's going to happen with that? Are people going to cancel me? Okay. Yeah. I still have all that. Right. And, but then I'm just like, mm, no, the Buddhas are telling me, be brave, go out there, say your thing, be useful, be beneficial, be of benefit. Useful is the wrong word. It sounds like all capitalists, be of benefit to others. And uh, I know that they, that they know they want me to succeed. And so I feel like held. I feel like they got me. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. I love doing that to folks. <laughs> I <laughs> that love was that. Awesome. I love that framework of questioning. A um, couple of things to get you out quick. And I have so many things that we're going to talk about the next time that you're on here that, you know, folks are just going to have to wait for. Um, but where, you know, the book is coming. Where yeah. can people support you and your work oh. in the ways that you want to be supported? How wonderful. Yeah. I mean, um, I am not really out there in the world so much, right? Honestly, for, for the year of 2024, um, I'm going to be doing like maybe a couple of talks and that's it. Um, the way people can support me, honestly, is that like after this, you will go check out my website and then there's a contact Sujatha page and it says, Sujatha is not doing things. Um, and so please forgive me if I do not write you back. I, I get like my inbox is overflowing with survivors and with folks who've caused harm and with people who, you know, would like me to be interviewed for your, you know, school newspaper or for your master's thesis or whatever. And I, I can't tell once upon a time, if anyone wanted to even hear anything I was saying, I was like, oh my goodness, yes. And now I'm kind of drowning in requests. And so, um, forgive me. Um, that is how you can support me. Forgive me uh, for not being able to get back to you as quickly as I would like, or at all, um, or for sending you in some other direction. And, um, and yeah, someday when I have sold a book to somebody and it's out there in the world, check it out. Um, and yeah, I think that's it. And just really just keep lifting up restorative justice. Look to all the amazing organizations out there doing such incredible work across the board. There are so many, um, almost all of whom have been <laughs> on your show now, David. And I just, um, I would love to, to have people just, just keep the faith, uh, believe that it's possible. Um, those are some of the ways that you can support me. But right now I'm, I'm kind of going inward. I'm going on retreat. I'm going to do some more writing. I'm going to get quiet for a while and um, remember me when I come back. How's that? <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. And, you know, if you do like send, go, go to the contact page at sujathabelliga.com. I'll spell it correctly in the show notes yeah, yeah. in the description. Um, send a note in the contact about like how awesome she was on the podcast. And then you'll be tuned in on the email list whenever the book does come out. And so okay. let's do that. There's okay. our call to action. Um, okay. Josh, uh, Means I have to make an you. email list. Okay. I will know. <laughs> Inherent. Well, we'll talk about that. Out, thank you. I need all this. that help. I need yeah. all that help. <laughs> um, Sujatha, thank you so, oh my so gosh. much. Um, you know, I'm very much looking forward to the next time uh, we're in space together and Me sharing too. these airwaves. Uh, but for those of you listening, 
I know you've been blessed by all of this, and we'll be back with another episode uh, with Sujatha actually early next week, the Restorative Justice Reflections, um, and then next Thursday um, with somebody else living this restorative justice life. But until then, take care. Thanks so much, David. Appreciate you.